Okay, I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation. It is Thursday, April 21, 2018, and I'm in Columbus, Ohio with Tom Mason. And my first question to him is to say his name, his full name, and spell it. Uh, my name's Thomas Mason, T-H-O-M-A-S-M-A-S-O-N. So the first thing I want to uh, have you tell us about is, is um, yourself, your, where you were born, what kind of education you had, um, and why, why you became a scientist. Uh, science is kind of the family business for me. I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and uh, my dad worked at a Canadian government research lab called the Bedford Institute for Oceanography. He's a geophysicist, and um, my mom was trained as a biochemist and was working at Dalhousie University in Halifax. So I kind of grew up around science and, and grew up around, around labs. Did your parents encourage you to be a scientist, or you just... Uh, not overtly, uh, but obviously just being in that kind of environment, it, it was sort of natural for me to gravitate towards science. So, in, you know, in high school I knew I wanted to study physics and that's what my undergraduate degree is in. Yeah, I did, I did my undergraduate degree at Dalhousie University in Halifax, which was the, you know, university close to where I grew up uh, in, in uh, physics. And then I went on to do graduate work, do a PhD at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton near Toronto. And my thesis research, most of it was actually carried out using major facilities at National Labs, working at Chuck River, which is kind of a Canadian version of uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, it was also created as kind of an offshoot from the Manhattan Project. It was kind of the British outpost where a lot of the people who couldn't get security clearances go to go to Los Alamos wound up. Um, and I also did uh, experiments at Brookhaven uh, as a student. So it, it just seemed like the, the natural thing for me to do to kind of go down that track given the fact that I'd grown up in a family of uh, scientists and you know my parents, friends, and colleagues were all uh, sort of in the, in the same general area. Uh, so it was very kind of familiar territory. That's interesting because we're, we're actually doing a project on French atomic scientists. And there were a, a couple or four of them who ended up at, in Montreal. Right, and yeah, the heavy water. They sort of came with the heavy water and initially they were in Montreal. And then Chalk River, I think, was the place they decided to actually build the heavy water reactor, which was kind of a strategy for plutonium. Um, it wasn't the kind of the main strategy that was being pursued, so I think that was one of the reasons that it was sort of left to the British, so to speak. And uh, Chalk River was fairly close to Ottawa, but out of the way. Same sort of siting criteria you see for the Manhattan Project sites. You know, it was actually near a military base called Petawawa, so from a security point of view it was attractive and it was the sort of place where you could quickly build some facilities and people might not notice because it was, it was a little bit off in the woods. Interesting. So you found though that national laboratories in the United States were very receptive to your collaborating, they invited, you, invited scientists from Canada or how, how, it, how did that work? Well, the, you know, many of the major facilities at the DOE labs are user facilities, uh, which really means that they're built and operated for the express purpose of making them available to the broader research community. And, and uh, so as a student working at Brookhaven, that came about through that user facility model with the high flux beam reactor, HFBR as it was called, and also the National Synchrotron Light Source, NSLS. I actually used both facilities while I was a student. And, as I said, they're sort of designed to be available to the research community. It's all open literature research and, and you know, most of those facilities are internationally open on a kind of reciprocal basis. Researchers will come to the U.S., use facilities there. American researchers will go overseas uh, to uh, use facilities um, and, and that's been kind of the practice really since that model got started in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and, and it's something that's still carried on today with user facilities. You know, now at Brookhaven, it's NSLS2. Um, HFBR is no more, it's closed down, but of course we have things like the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge, which is kind of uh, 
replaced it in some sense as a neutron facility for the material science community and it was condensed matter physics was my specialty and, and I used neutrons and x-rays to study the structure and dynamics of materials. So your timing as you were emerging from graduate school was pretty, pretty excellent given the spallation neutron source was underway or have I got the chronology wrong? Uh, that came a little later actually at the time I finished my graduate work my timing was not so excellent uh, because most of the U.S. facilities were closed. Uh, that was an era that's uh, referred to as the Tiger Teams. Uh, so I finished my Ph.D. in 1990. I actually interviewed for postdocs at, at both um, Brookhaven and Oak Ridge. And at that time, both reactors were closed. So there had been, I think, um, uh, you know, concerns about safety and environmental uh, impacts associated with Manhattan Project legacies. And that kind of came to a head in the late 80s. And uh, at the time, uh, Admiral Watkins was the Secretary of Energy and instituted these Tiger teams who, you know, went around to, you know, look for, look for undiscovered legacy issues and so forth. And uh, the reactors, HFBR and HFIR, HIFR at Oak Ridge, uh, were kind of caught up in that and got shut down for extended periods of time as they relooked at safety bases and that sort of thing. So at the time I was looking for a postdoc, the, the, although I actually was offered positions at both labs, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to, uh, to, to uh, go to a facility that wasn't running uh, as a postdoc where you've got kind of two years or so to you know, produce some results to get you a, a permanent job. So I wound up going to AT&T Bell Labs and uh, working in Europe, actually using European facilities which were, which were uh, operating at the time. They didn't have the Tiger teams. Um, the Spallation Neutron Source didn't come along until a little bit later after I finished my postdoc. I worked for a, for a while in Denmark uh, and then uh, took on a faculty position in the physics department at the University of Toronto and did that for five years. And it was at that point in time that the Spallation Neutron Source was just getting started as a construction project. And uh, so that was when I made the decision to move from Toronto to Oak Ridge to kind of participate in that just uh, immediately prior to actually getting the line item construction funding in 1998. So for the non-physicists who will be listening to this, for the student wannabes who are thinking of science, tell, tell us a little bit more about your particular area, area of interest. And well, condensed matter physics is sort of the physics of the things that make up the world around us, the materials that we use to uh, you know, make everything from consumer electronics to automobiles to airplanes, you know, everything is made of stuff and condensed matter physicists study the stuff. And in the end, it's uh, how the atoms are arranged and how they move that determine the properties of those materials. Uh, the physical properties, you know, their strength, uh, their weight, um, how, how ductile they are or their electronic properties, whether they conduct electricity or not, and magnetic properties. And, and those electronic, magnetic, physical, chemical properties are what makes the materials both interesting and useful. And uh, so if you're trying to understand why materials behave the way they do, you know, with a goal of ultimately making better materials, um, you need to know where the atoms are and how they move. And that's why techniques like x-ray scattering and neutron scattering, both of which are employed at some of the Department of Energy lab user facilities are very useful because you can actually see very precisely exactly where the atoms are and how they're moving around and that, that gives you a direct handle on why the materials behave the way they do. So tell us about the uh, wonders of the spallation neutron source. What is that? How does that work? Well, the spallation neutron source is an accelerator-based source of neutrons. So historically, uh, the first neutron sources were actually radioactive sources. Just natural radioactive decay will produce a very small amount of neutrons. And that's how the neutron was first discovered in the 30s. Chadwick discovered the neutron in 1932. And so people were able to kind of study neutrons a little bit uh, in, the, in the 30s with, with natural radioactive sources. Um, but 
you can't get enough neutrons to really do anything useful uh, from, a, from a natural source. You need to produce the neutrons somehow. And uh, it became possible to produce neutrons in large quantities for the first time as a consequence of the Manhattan Project and the graphite reactor at Oak Ridge or the X10 pile or the Clinton pile. It's sort of got various names that it's been called over the years. Was uh, really the first example of a dedicated purpose built neutron source. Uh, of course, you had the Chicago pile uh, in the squash courts at, at Stagg Field in Chicago that was the very first chain reaction, but that was kind of a jury rigged thing. I mean, it was, you know, plywood and duct tape and uh, graphite blocks stacked up with uranium, and, and once it had demonstrated yes, you can sustain a chain reaction, then the very next step was to build a real engineered uh, facility. And that's what uh, the graphite reactor was. It was that sort of first engineered purpose-built reactor. It actually ran for 20 years. It was shut down in 1963 on the 20th anniversary of first criticality. And it was a source of neutrons initially to study the properties of materials relevant to the war effort, so measure neutron cross-sections that were important for the design of, uh, of the bomb, uh, and also to serve as a prototype for the Hanford production facilities. But in addition, it was also a neutron source that was very useful for making enough neutrons that you could actually begin to use them for different things. So you had, for example, the first uh, reactor-produced medical isotopes that were, um, in 1946, uh, you know, shared with medical researchers from St. Louis, and that was done at the graphite reactor. But another thing that happened uh, kind of on the, on the edges of the Manhattan Project was the development of this technique called neutron scattering. Uh, and initially it was being done as a way to measure neutron cross-sections, which was very important to, you know, the design of a nuclear weapon. You had to know you know, what the probability of a neutron being captured was. Um, but it turned out to be a very useful technique for understanding uh, where the atoms are and how they move. And um, so reactors were the primary neutron sources for many years after that. There were subsequent generations of reactors like the high flux isotope reactor and the high flux beam reactor that were built at Oak Ridge and uh, Brookhaven. In the uh, 70s, um, there was work done at Argonne and at a sister facility in Japan exploring um, the use of this alternative technology called spallation to produce neutrons using an accelerator, proton accelerator. And uh, this had first been proposed actually in the 50s by Ernest Lawrence uh, as a actually as a breeder for fissile material. He had this concept called the materials test accelerator that, that was explored at um, what is now Livermore site in California. Uh, but it really only became demonstrated as a viable technique to study materials at, in the work that was done at, at Argonne and at KK in Japan. And uh, you, the, the way it works is you, you have a proton accelerator, it accelerates protons up to pretty high energy you slam those protons into pretty much any heavy nucleus and neutrons are spalled off. So the term spallation is actually a German prospecting term. It refers to what happens when you hit a rock with a ball-peen hammer and fragments fly off in all directions. So the ball-peen hammer is the proton, the rock is the heavy nucleus, and the neutrons are the fragments that fly off. And so uh, people like Jack Carpenter working with a facility called um, uh, Zing the, um, was, the, was the name of it. it, was based on an accelerator called the ZGS and it was an intense neutron generator that led to Zing and then there were various iterations of Zing. Um, that led to the decision to build something called the IPNS, the Intense Pulse Neutron Source that was a repurposing of what had been a nuclear physics accelerator at Argonne, this, this ZGS. So they took that, uh, the shell of that facility, built up an accelerator and in the 80s, that really um, proved out that, that in addition to getting neutrons from fission that were useful to study materials, you could also use this spallation technique uh, and an accelerator-based source of neutrons. And um, at the time, a lot fewer neutrons. So the preferred source was still a high-flux reactor, but the accelerator technology kept improving. 
uh, actually in large measure because of work done uh, in the Department of Energy in pursuit of high energy nuclear physics that was driving accelerator technology so that you could get more and more powerful proton accelerators. There was also uh, work done in Europe with a facility called ISIS um, uh, near Oxford at the Rutherford lab that kind of pushed to another threshold of performance. So by the 90s when the U.S. was contemplating building a next generation neutron source and uh, you know the initial idea was to build a reactor because that was kind of the preferred uh, high intensity source certainly in the 80s still. Um, but that was getting more difficult and getting more expensive so there was a proposal to build a reactor called the Advanced Neutron Source in Oak Ridge that was unsuccessful. The price got up to about 3.9 billion dollars and coming on the heels of the failure of the superconducting supercollider project uh, there just wasn't the appetite to undertake that kind of a risk uh, and so the kind of fallback plan was to build a approximately one megawatt spallation source which was thought to be feasible for somewhere in the neighborhood of about a billion dollars. And that's what became what's now known as the SNS, the Spallation Neutron Source. It was the kind of response of the failure of the Advanced Neutron Source was to say, okay, if, if, if that's not going to work, if it's too risky, it's too expensive, this accelerator technology has improved to the point where, you know, we can now do a one megawatt spallation source. Actually, it turned out the design power of SNS is 1.4 megawatts, so it was able to push a little beyond the kind of uh, baseline uh, expectation. And um, it has a number of advantages in terms of the technical performance of the source. Of course, at Oak Ridge, uh, the lab is fortunate that it has both a reactor-based source with HIFER continuous source of neutrons and the accelerator based spallation neutron source which is pulsed it's like a strobe light and so turns out scientifically there are useful things that you can do with that stroboscopic kind of source that are different from what you would do with a continuous source of neutrons like the reactor so both of them are running today uh, serving somewhat different uh, scientific disciplines just based on whatever the science needs in terms of the characteristics of the source. So can you give some examples for the layman of the uh, discoveries that come out of, let's say, the spallation neutron source that, that may be tangible to them? Well, neutrons uh, are useful because of particular properties of neutrons that allow you to kind of see, if you will, although in the end you're really looking at reconstructed computer images and so forth that are pulled out of the data. So it's not quite imaging in the way that you would think of looking through a microscope, but it's, it's, it's a bit like that in terms of being able to reconstruct um, features that you can't see with other techniques. So with x-rays, of course everyone's kind of familiar with the chest x-ray type thing, and with an x-ray you see the bone structure, you don't see the light tissue, you don't see the, the, uh, you know, the skin and the muscle and the fat and the water, uh, but you see the, the bones. And the reason is because x-rays are sensitive to the um, electrons and heavy elements have more electrons than light elements. So x-rays don't really see hydrogen very well and that's what makes up a lot of the light tissue in, in the human body or, or in any living thing. But a heavy element, like a uh, more heavy element, like the calcium that's in our bones, you know, will absorb x-rays. So if you take a, an x-ray of an image, uh, you'll, you'll see those, uh, you know, the bone structure, and that's why x-rays are used the way they are to diagnose, you know, fractures and that sort of thing. Neutrons are different, uh, and actually with neutrons, one of their features is that you can see the light elements. They're much more sensitive to light elements, relatively speaking than x-rays would be. So that makes neutrons useful if you want to figure out where the light elements are. So for example, if you're trying to um, develop new drugs to treat disease and you want to understand how they work, often it's important to understand the proteins that those drugs may be interacting with. And those proteins typically have a kind of a backbone that's made up of heavier elements, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, but they also have a lot of hydrogen and sometimes that hydrogen is really important for how those proteins work. Uh, and so you may 
use x-rays to figure out the backbone structure of a protein and then you want to really understand how does it really work in the body and how is it that this potential drug might you know bolt onto it uh, and you can use neutrons to determine that find out where those hydrogen atoms are that might be important for the functioning of that protein and so uh, that's that's one particular application uh, another thing that neutrons are well suited to is actually studying magnetism. Uh, the neutron is a little magnet, and so that means that it interacts with magnets uh, in materials. And so uh, if you're trying to understand you know, complicated artificial magnetic structures that might be used in hard drive reach heads or magnetic memory storage, uh, sort of an IT type application, then you can use neutrons to study those sorts of structures. Uh, so uh, there are just different aspects of materials properties that neutrons give you a particular uh, kind of uh, view on. And, and as I said, it's those, those mechanical, the, the physical, magnetic, electronic properties of the materials that make them useful. And so understanding the microscopic basis, you know, the, the origins and the structure of the material uh, neutrons give you a, a very good way of, of uh, understanding that. And they're the things that we see in our everyday life, whether it's, you know, magnets that are used in electric motors. You know, one kind of everyday example is it wasn't that long ago that uh, electric car windows were kind of a luxury item and only available in, in big luxury cars. Uh, they're now much more widespread and a lot smaller. So now even in sort of small subcompact cars with really thin doors, you can have uh, electric windows. And the reason is because there are now magnets that have allowed us to miniaturize those electric motors. And you know, neutrons are used to study what makes those magnets uh, such good magnets that uh, you can accommodate you know, a much smaller uh, structure for that electric motor. Uh, mentioned already the example of pharmaceutical drug development. Uh, and, uh, you know, one way to think about materials is to remember that the ages of civilization are actually defined by the materials that we have understanding and use of. So you have the Stone Age, and the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, now maybe the Silicon Age. And our ability to understand and manipulate those materials kind of defines our economic strength, uh, you know, through the technologies that we can deploy. It also defines our military strength. You know, if you're a Bronze Age civilization and you come into conflict with an Iron Age civilization, you're probably not going to do so well. Uh, and, and same thing is true economically. So that's kind of the driver behind the science. That's why there are public investments in these kind of facilities, because they underpin, you know, our standard of living, our economic security and our national security. So I think I read there are 20,000 different users have actually come to the Splation Neutron Source, uh, some such number, when a large number of people are taking advantage of this resource. Can you um, sort of give us a general sense of, I mean, are 10 percent of those people looking at drugs, or the military is, is a, you know, taking advantage of technology and are, are looking to the Splation Neutron Source to so one of the, I think one of the really interesting things about uh, a facility like SNS or the sister facilities the, around the world is that it's got a very diverse user community. So you have uh, people from my background, condensed matter physics kind of invented the technique, if you will, but now it's used by, by chemists and biologists and materials scientists and engineers. Um, so it's got a very diverse user community. Um, the vast majority of the work that's done is uh, open literature, basic science, so the results are, you know, published and widely distributed, um, kind of pre-competitive research. There is some industrial use, uh, often in that pre-competitive phase, though. There's, there's a little bit of proprietary work where companies will, will pay in order to keep the results to themselves. If the results are shared, then there's no charge to use the facilities because the society as a whole gets to benefit. But if a company wants to come in and, you know, it's something they're really not interested in sharing, then they can pay full cost recovery and keep those results to themselves. And that's done some, you know, it's kind of a 5% of the uses uh, roughly is, is kind of in that proprietary road. The rest is, is 
open li literature research that most of the users come from universities. So a typical research group would be a faculty member who has funding from you know, some Department of Energy or National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and they may bring with them you know, a couple postdocs and graduate students uh, who they'll use the facility for a couple of days or maybe a week and then go back to their uh, university and analyze the data and publish the results. Um, there are also users from other national labs, uh, both users from Oak Ridge, obviously, in the case of SNS, but actually all the DOE labs are trying to study materials for various purposes. Um, and uh, at the moment, there's not a lot of classified research that goes on at the facilities, because as I said, it is more fundamental uh, research. Um, and uh, it's an interesting mix, because you have all these different disciplines, people from all different sorts of institutions, often working together on the same projects. And because it's available internationally, you know, you have people coming from other countries, uh, because the facilities are really quite unique. Uh, there's a facility in Japan that's close to SNS in terms of performance. It's, it's about a third, uh, you know, third to a half of the intensity. So there are a lot of experiments that can really only be done at SNS, and so it attracts people from all over the world. Um, it's about three quarters academic, and the other 25% is industry and, and national lab. So in looking back, I mean, this was uh, a, a Phoenix kind of facility that, that grew out of the failure of the advanced, you know, the earlier advanced neutron source, right? Yeah. But, and so there were compromises to kind of keep its energy level at a certain affordable amount, but it sounds like it's, it's proven to be very effective. Yeah, I mean, it, it's um, because of the technological progress in, in accelerators, uh, I think in the end, we got a better answer than if we'd built the reactor. Um, you know, one of, the th one of the changes that we were able to take advantage of was the development of superconducting accelerators. Uh, and so the bulk, 80% of the acceleration is actually done using niobium superconducting radio frequency cavities. And that was a, that was a pretty new technology. The Jefferson Lab facility in Virginia actually uh, made major pioneering efforts in that technology for a nuclear physics facility and uh, SNS was able to kind of adapt it to this, uh, with, that's an accelerator, uh, uh, an electron accelerator, SNS was able to adapt it to a, a proton accelerator and that's given a machine with tremendous flexibility um, and, and also because of the way that it works it's, it's proven to be very robust and reliable and, and not only that, actually, it's built in some upgradability. So there's actually a project that was just approved in the budget that just passed uh, to upgrade the power by adding more of those superconducting cavities. That allows you to go to a higher proton energy, which allows you to also run more current through the machine. And, and that means the power goes up and the number of neutrons is directly proportional to the beam power. So. So that'll, that'll mean that SNS continues to stay at the forefront. You know, it's been, been running for um, uh, uh, over, uh, over 10 years now. And uh, there's a facility in Europe that's under construction that's going to be uh, very impressive in terms of its characteristics. So being able to upgrade SNS will, will keep it, you know, in, in the sort of best-in-class category that, it, that it's in right now. Uh, but it's, it's proven to be, you know, I think, as I said, the, the right technological choice. And, and the, because of the unique kind of character of that stroboscopic aspect of its operation, it's, it's got uh, some really special capabilities for doing things that we just couldn't do before it was built. One of the characteristics of the Manhattan Project, um, if you look at, let's just say, the way Oppenheimer ran the laboratory there, when they run into a problem, he would have a colloquium and bring in people from multiple disciplines, and they'd do kind of a brainstorming and you know, present a, a problem, and people from, you know, mathematicians who are not involved in the physics would, might have an insight. To what extent does the, the laboratory uh, work with kind of a, a cross-disciplinary or a collaborative um, approach. Is there any of that Manhattan Project um, 
management style that, that still is relevant today? Actually, it, it, it's, it's, it's still relevant. It's still part of the way that things get done. In fact, that's part of the power of the national labs is the fact that there are these environments where you can bring together you know, pretty diverse skill sets, skill sets and apply them to solving an important problem in a way that's actually harder to do in an academic environment where, you know, to some extent at a university, the great strength of the universities is you've got hundreds or thousands of entrepreneurs and they're all kind of pursuing their own vision in terms of what interests them and, you know, great things happen as a result of that. But it's not an environment where you can put together a team of several hundred people and say, go and solve this really tough problem. And that's something that the national labs can do well and so with a project like Splation Neutron Source, it's a good example of that. So at the peak of the design effort, there were, I think, somewhere between seven and 800 scientists and engineers working at six different DOE labs on the design of that facility. And that was then complemented by the fact that, that over the years, that, that model that you talked about that you know, Oppenheimer cultivated of, of you know, brainstorming around problems has sort of got built into the way that the Department of Energy's Office of Science approaches these big first-of-a-kind projects where they have these, this review process, a peer review process, where in fact for SNS, every six months, we would have a team come in uh, made up of experts from around the system, so other DOE labs, supplemented by people from you know, international facilities that you know, had a, a relevant experience, and they would come in and dig into the problems that we were having and offer up recommendations and you know when you're trying to do the first um, megawatt class pulse neutron source or the first free electron laser like the slack uh, completed uh, not that long ago you run into a lot of challenging technical problems and so being able to pull together all these different disciplines and kind of say okay here's what we're struggling with and get some good ideas is part of what allows those facilities to be successful. It's interesting that you, you know, raise the international aspect of this collaboration. Um, I was actually over at CERN not long ago, and they have the first ever room that's sort of their museum, and they, if you like, they're, with their first ac accelerator. And on the wall are photographs of about 15 men, and I would say about 10 of them were involved in the Manhattan Project. They had been European scientists, many of them refugees from um, Hitler's Europe, a Nazi, uh, and, and came to this country and then after the war wanted to go back and restore the preeminence of European science and that was one of the projects. But it's interesting that it, this sort of, it's an, it's an international discipline after all, I guess. I mean, let you uh, take it from here, what's your perspective on yeah, this? Yeah, well, it's certainly, tr you know, the Manhattan Project had major contributions from a lot of refugee scientists, people like Fermi and, and uh, Wigner, who was instrumental in, in some of the early years at Oak Ridge. And, and um, uh, you know, in the period of time immediately following that, uh, the U.S. was in kind of a unique position because, of course, Europe was largely destroyed. Japan was, was devastated. So, um, you know, the U.S. was in a, a very, very dominant position economically and scientifically. So in, in the 50s and, and really into the 60s, the investment in those big science facilities, and the term big science, of course, was coined by Alvin Weinberg uh, around what had emerged from the Manhattan Project where you could get these big teams, build these unique facilities and tackle problems that you just never would have been able to tackle in, in other ways. And so through the 50s and 60s, um, the US was, was pioneering that, but at the same time, Europe was being rebuilt and, and Japan was being rebuilt and becoming more economically powerful. And institutions like CERN were actually seen as a way, first off, of kind of um, participating in that big science in a way that would have been harder for smaller European countries to do. So by banding together, they had the kind of economic wherewithal to, to build a major facility. But it was also seen as a way of 
knitting together Europe. So CERN was explicitly an exercise in European integration. Science was something that you could do that everyone could agree to work together on. And particularly something like the particle physics that CERN does, which was, you know, fundamental science. It wasn't too close to the competitive stuff where, you know, national economies and so forth. Um, a similar facility was the Institut Larry Langevin, which is a neutron facility in Grenoble that was initially French-German collaboration, trying to bring France and Germany to closer together in the 60s, uh, that was, was worked out between Adenauer and de Gaulle. Uh, the Brits later joined, and, and then it became more of a European-wide facility. And of course, some of the scientists, as you point out, who, who returned to Europe after the war were kind of instrumental in doing that because of what they learned during their time in the US. Um, the interesting thing is that then, you know, in the end, it cycles around. So for example, when we were building SNS, we benefited tremendously for some of the advice and technology development that had gone on in Japan and Europe. So um, just as the US had made available its facilities and expertise for doing basic science to scientists from Japan and Europe, you know, they kind of ran with it, and as I mentioned, the ISIS facility in the UK, uh, there was important work on the superconducting accelerator technology that took place in Germany at DESI in Hamburg, which is a, a German um, research lab, and some of the partnership around developing spallation sources between Argonne and KEK in Japan, uh, we were able to draw on that expertise to assist us in solving some of the technical problems that we encountered along the road to SNS. So, you know, science is a very international game. And uh, even though the kind of economic aspects of the downstream benefits often wind up being pretty intensely competitive, because, you know, in the end it's about jobs, it's about GDP growth. Uh, on, on the more basic science end of the spectrum, it's still pretty collaborative and we can learn a lot from one another. And then once things turn into products and companies, then we'll compete. And uh, it, it's been, I think, was helpful in the development of Europe at a certain time and, and now we've been able to benefit and now the Europeans are building a new facility in Sweden uh, and they're able to draw on some of the expertise that we developed in building SNS in Oak Ridge. So it kind of goes back and forth and I think as long as it's um, reciprocal, everyone benefits, you know, all boats get floated and, and we all learn a lot and we make better facilities, we do more science and we advance the state of human health and technology development. All of that reminds me of the, the sort of history of reactor, the reactor development, you know, which really got its start in the Manhattan Project, of course, and X10 was very important in in uh, you know, as a second or in the first pilot scale reactor and then looking at what happened at at uh, Idaho um, under Argonne's leadership during the 50s and where people from all over the world would come to spend time with them and learn the fundamentals and then go back to their countries and start their reactor um, programs but in the last you know two three decades much of you know, our industry that's focused on nuclear reactors is sort of um, is elsewhere. <laughs> so the, the industry has been led by the, the French and, and other other organizations, and yet at Oak Ridge today you have new initiatives that uh, maybe you can tell us about. Well, the the um, uh, you know Oak Ridge has been involved in reactor development since it was created. Um, and at the time that the, um, the Idaho site was being used as the nation's kind of reactor test bed and Argonne was building, you know, 50 odd different types of reactors. Uh, actually, Oak Ridge was involved in that. There was a, a, a joint effort to build what became the prototype for kind of swimming pool research reactors. Um, uh, with the MTR was actually a joint Oak Ridge Argonne effort that was built at Idaho. Uh, and there were a number of different kind of innovative designs that were explored in those early years for different sorts of reactors. So it wasn't, you know, the power reactor that you see today is, is uh, you know, some variant on a light water reactor that was developed uh, 
as part of the Rick, uh, you know, Rickover's effort for the nuclear navy. That was not originally thought of as a power reactor technology. In fact, if you, you know, if you read Alvin Weinberg's biography where he talks about this, um, they felt like the light water reactor was, was great for the Navy because the Navy would have access to enriched uranium, uh, which was going to be needed for the naval reactors, um, and also was really interested in something very compact. Uh, it didn't have to be terribly thermodynamic efficient, thermodynamically efficient, so the fact that it was sort of limited to boiling water type temperatures wasn't really a problem because there was a, a lot of power on the scale of a submarine or a, or, or a naval vessel. Uh, but the thought was that for a power reactor, you would really like to have something that operated at higher temperature, that's more thermodynamically efficient, and only the military would have access to enriched uranium. And at the time, in the 50s, um, uranium was thought to be pretty scarce. So there was a lot of interest in, in other potential feedstocks, like thorium, for example. So there was work to look at different reactor concepts. Uh, and that included um, molten salt reactors, which was something Oak Ridge was very involved in, and also um, sodium-cooled fast reactors, which was something that Argonne was really interested in. And they were intended to be what's called a closed fuel cycle, where you would kind of recycle the fuel, uh, so you didn't have to worry so much about uranium supply and so forth. And uh, because the Navy uh, really was the institution that was prepared to the, make the really big investments to move beyond R&D and prototyping to actual deployed reactors, that meant that when it came time to deploy power reactors, that technology had such a head start that it was the only thing that was, was really ready to go. So that's why we have in the reactor fleet, both in the US and around the world, light water reactors. It's because the Navy did the first of a kind deployment. That's the really, really expensive, hard thing. The attractive aspects of some of those alternative technologies haven't changed. And so actually now there's some renewed interest in, in some of those, you know, those old ideas have become new again. So there's a lot of startup companies that are looking at things like the molten salt reactor technology. Um, and, and that's led to renewed interest, and, and you see that in work that's being done at Oak Ridge, work that's being done at Idaho, work that's being done at Argonne, as people kind of look back at some of those old ideas and say, you know what, there was a there, there was a lot behind that. It actually did make a lot of sense, and particularly as you look at the um, energy demand of a growing population globally with growing standard of living and concerns about CO2 emissions, uh, the ability to have access to an energy supply that's essentially carbon free, and certainly if you go to the uh, recycle type fuel options, not limited in terms of the fuel supply is very attractive in terms of you know the long-term prospects for humanity. You basically, if if you if you want to be able to supply uh, nine billion people, a much larger fraction of whom have a high standard of living than we see today. You know, if you look 30 years into the future, um, you've got three options. You've got um, what we call renewables, which one form or another generally are solar energy. Wind energy is actually solar energy because it's driven by the, the sunlight, you know, hitting the earth and driving, uh, driving the weather. Uh, hydro power is actually a form of solar energy because it's the water cycle, the evaporation, you know, getting water to higher elevations where you can then capture it as it heads back to sea level. Uh, and direct solar energy in the form of photovoltaic. So, all of those share the characteristic that the fuel supply is, for practical purposes, inexhaustible because the sun's going to keep going long enough that I'm not too worried about when it's done. Um, and there's no emissions associated with it. Uh, there are technical challenges because it's mostly, it's intermittent. So you've got to figure out how to solve that, you know, with energy storage and smart grid and so forth. So promise, but technical challenges. Uh, another option is the kind of closed cycle nuclear. So things like the fast breeder reactors, molten salt, so forth. Um, we know we can do that. It's been demonstrated. Uh, it was demonstrated in the 50s. The challenges there are how expensive is it going to be and 
what's the public acceptance? And there are potential technological solutions to both those things, and that's kind of what's being explored as people look at some of these with renewed interest at some of these old concepts. And then the third option is fusion, uh, where again, you don't have a real constraint in terms of fuel supply. The challenge is there is can you actually make it work in a controlled way that you can get power from it? Um, you know, we have fusion releasing power in the form of our nuclear weapons, but that's not very useful in terms of uh, generating electricity. So that's why people look at things like tokamaks and so forth. So, um, you know, all three of those different potential energy sources for the future of humanity are elements of the R&D that goes on in the DOE labs today, uh, including at, at Oak Ridge. Of course, that is one of the biggest challenges, as you, as you pointed out. Nine billion people whose standard of living is hopefully going to rise or appears to be rising and will demand more electricity. So. Well, you know, one way to think about it is um, if you look at the amount of energy associated with being a human, you know, you consume two to 3,000 calories per day. That keeps you moving. Um, if you look at the amount of energy that you use to move you around, to give you light, to give you heat in the winter and, and cool you in the summer, it's actually about 100 times that. So what that means, one way to think about that is, and that's in the, in the US, in a developed country. It's much less than that, obviously, in the developing world. So in a developed country, uh, a family of four in the US has the equivalent of 400 energy servants doing all those things that you know used to be done by real servants. Uh, you know, you had people building fires for you and carrying you around. You know, if, if you were uh, a pharaoh or something like that. So, so every family of four in the U.S. has the energy equivalent of 400 servants maintaining their standard of living, um, and. Uh, that standard of living is something that the entire world aspires to. And we can't very well tell them, no, no, you stay poor. We're quite comfortable with our standard of living. Um, and, um, and so it's really the, that combination of aspiring to that standard of living and the fact that there are just more people. So more people, more energy per person, where are you going to get it? And the challenge is that the, right now, you know, roughly 80% of our energy comes from, from fossil fuels. And we know that uh, the CO2 emissions are a problem with fossil fuels. And we also know ultimately that there's a limit. Now, that limit may be depending on, you know, what particular form of fossil fuel you're talking about. The limit may be a ways off, but it's still finite. There's a finite resource there. So at some point in time, you've got to get beyond the CO2 emissions and get beyond the finite resources. And that's what brings you back to the, you know, which is going to work? Is it going to be renewables? Is it going to be fission? Or is it going to be fusion? Or is it going to be some combination because they have dis different attributes? And, and um, you know, given that you can't predict really ultimately which ones will uh, work, you know, from a research point of view, the right approach is to hedge your bets and try and solve the problems associated with all of them. So it is somewhat ironic, as you mentioned, that molten salt reactors is sort of becoming, taking a second look at that. So I think I read that Alvin Weinberg was actually fired from Oak Ridge because he, he preferred that. Yeah, well, he, you know, there, the, it gets to this problem of the cost of scale up. So I mentioned that the, the Navy was prepared to pay the cost to make light water reactors viable because that was the right solution for submarines and aircraft carriers. Um, so that, that cost is a really big number. Doing, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but the, the sort of small experimental prototypes in the grand scheme of things are not that expensive. So you can explore a bunch of different ideas in the prototype feasibility phase. But when you say, okay, we want to take one of these to the point of first deployment, now all of a sudden it gets really expensive. So in the 70s, uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, people were working on multiple different options and trying to down select and say, okay, we can't take all of these to the point of deployment. That's gonna be more expensive than the country can bear. So you're gonna have to down select. And that's what happened in 1973. 
uh, the decision was made to pursue the um, uh, sodium-cooled fast reactor and uh, to terminate the efforts on the molten salt reactor that had been pers pursued by Oak Ridge, and Weinberg was the champion of that. He'd been instrumental in, in, you know, the initial work to develop it was actually kind of a bit of a bootleg effort on the aircraft reactor program. Uh, and so the first prototypes were, were actually uh, as part of that effort. Um, but there was, there was a molten salt reactor at Oak Ridge that had been operating and uh, as I said, the decision was made we're going to pursue the, um, the fast breeder. I think mainly because uh, the, with the fast breeder you got, you got more neutron multiplication. So as a breeder it had more potential for making more fuel as well as power at the same time. And they were still worried about fuel supply at that point in time. Um, but, you know, Alvin was uh, pretty confident that the molten salt was a superior technology. I mean, it does have certain advantages uh, because of the way it works. It's at low pressure but high temperature, so it's thermodynamically efficient, but because it's at low pressure, you worry less about releases. And because it's a liquid-fueled system, you can kind of do inline um, reprocessing of the fuel. You don't have to kind of take the fuel out and dissolve it and chemically reprocess it. So, so he, he felt like it was the wrong decision and, um, uh, you know, resisted it. And uh, it turned out that that was his undoing because uh, in the end, I think the Atomic Energy Commission didn't take too kindly to <laughs> insubordination. And the story I've been told, I, mean, I don't know if this is true, is that, you know, on Friday the auditors arrived and on Monday he was out of a job. Uh, now, it turned out that not long after that, uh, and actually that led to, it was amazing, 73 was an amazing year for Oak Ridge. I think something like 900 people were laid off as a consequence of that decision to, to um, disband the molten salt reactor effort. Then the Arab oil embargo hit. Uh, and now all of a sudden, energy, nuclear energy, became really important again. Uh, up to that point, gas was cheap. When gas is cheap, we don't spend a lot of money on energy research. Uh, Arab oil embargo hits, and actually by the end of 1973, Oak Ridge was back to the staffing levels that had been, been at the beginning of the year. So they laid off 900 people, and then hired 900 people in response to the Arab oil embargo, and Alvin wind up being put in charge of developing the plan uh, for the, what was then called ERDA, which was the Energy Research and Development Agency that preceded the Department of Energy. So he wound up in Washington in a role that was roughly analogous to the president's science advisor, since Nixon didn't have a science advisor. So, um, you know, he, 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 uh, he got the last laugh in a certain sense. <laughs> he landed on his feet. Yeah. <laughs> and then some. That's great. Um, do you want to talk about scientific computing? Because I know Oak Ridge is home of like two of the world's fastest uh, supercomputers. Well, computing has been uh, an important part of the way that the labs have done science since the beginning. Uh, so if you look at the efforts in the Manhattan Project, the supercomputer was Boy Scouts with adding machines. Um, and in fact, if you read um, uh, Richard Feynman's biography, it talks a little bit about that effort. You know, they had to calculate um, whether or not they were going to get yield and how much yield, you know, how, how, uh, how big an explosion was associated with, with Fat Man and Little Boy. And so in that case, you had uh, adding machines and humans. <laughs> that were trying to do those calculations to actually numerically integrate the um, formulas that were used to calculate yield. And so um, coming out of the Manhattan Project in the 50s, uh, there was a, a big push for more and more powerful computers and it was actually the nuclear weapons program that was driving that. So if you look at some of the first vacuum tube computers, where did they wind up? They wound up in places like uh, Los Alamos. Um, Oak Ridge had a machine called Oracle uh, that was um, uh, sort of the supercomputer of the day. Uh, and, and if you looked at what 
Oracle was used for. For example, uh, one of the things it was used for was uh, looking at some of those advanced reactor concepts. So there was a thing called a homogeneous solution reactor that was tested out at Oak Ridge. And actually, as a consequence of a leak, they had to close off part of the reactor. And then they had to calculate, will it be safe to run this reactor in a way that's a little bit different than it was originally designed for? They did those calculations on Oracle. And actually, today, with our supercomputers, which are vastly more powerful than Oracle, uh, we do the same sorts of things. We try and uh, you know, numerically integrate formulas that are important for, could be the operations of a nuclear reactor, could be modeling the climate, it could be trying to understand dynamics of materials. So we do all of those things using these uh, massively parallel supercomputers. Um, Titan being the current one, but it's actually on the way out. It's being replaced by Summit that's going to come online this year. Uh, and it was preceded by Jaguar. Uh, it's a very competitive field internationally. There's been huge investments actually in, in Europe and in Japan and, and especially in China uh, because uh, computing has become one way that people talk about it is sort of as a third leg of science. You know, historically you had experiments and you had theories and you tried to connect the theories to the experiments. And it turns out that with computers, you've got this third leg where you can actually, in a way, do experiments without actually doing the experiment. If you've got a good theory, you can model it on the computer. And in some cases, you can test things in ways that it would be really hard to do in the real world um, or really expensive. And so uh, that's how we've traditionally used computers is for that modeling and simulation. More recently, and this is something that really, I think, you'll see a lot more of going forward with machines like Summit. There's another piece. It's now not just the modeling and simulations, but it's also dealing with huge volumes of data uh, and uh, the ability to um, you know, use what's called machine learning or artificial intelligence to interrogate massive data sets that the human mind could never really get around and extract from that useful information um, is another really important technique. Of course, it's much talked about in the context of big data for social networking and you know, selling you things on the, on the internet and so forth, but it's also scientifically extremely useful as well, and, and that's just sort of emerged in the last decade or so. Well, that's another, <coughs> I guess, example of how the Manhattan Project recognized the importance of that. They did, they were so far at the, the uh, beginning stages of computers, as you mentioned, that the mechanical sets that the computers, so-called computer women, had to punch in. And, but then there was a, an IBM proto-computer that arrived at Los Alamos in, I think it was April, just in time to verify the, their crude estimates of what the yield would be that it gave them the confidence that this was going to work. Yeah. But that was, you know, again. Well, it's, I think it's an illustration of the value that you get from trying to solve really difficult problems. When you're trying to solve really difficult problems, you've got to be pretty ingenious to come up with new ways to do them. And, you know, uh, the computers weren't developed because people thought they wanted to make an Amazon or a Google to, you know, transform the economy. Um, they were developed because they had to do these calculations and, uh, you know, the adding machines just weren't cutting it. And so they had to come up with an electronic way to do that in an automated way. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, that turned out to have a much wider range of applications than anyone had ever thought. So if you'd gone to the, uh, well, certainly, you know, if you got to the Army Corps of Engineers, if you got to Groves and said, you know, we want to make a Google, he might have pointed out that we had more pressing things to work on at the moment. But even, even after the war, if you'd gone to the Atomic Energy Commission and said, hey, let's build these computers because they'll transform the economy, um, you know, first off, not credible. <laughs> I don't believe you. And secondly, that's not our mission. Uh, however, by trying to solve the mission problems that the AEC had, you had to develop this technology. Same with accelerators, same with reactors. It was mission driven, 
but by taking on that really difficult mission problem, you had to solve really tough problems and the solutions to those problems had a much broader applicability. So it wasn't an industrial policy. You know, the U.S. has always shied away from industrial policy. Uh, and, however, it, it turned out to be, I would say, better than any industrial policy. You know, no, no team of economists and think tanks could have laid out the plan that has led to U.S. technological and economic domination of the, uh, you know, post-war period uh, on the basis of, well, we're going to make these government investments in these things and they will turn into, you know, new companies that will employ people. It was just driven by the mission. We have problems to solve. When solving those problems, we made new things possible. And that's been very successful. And that reminds me that I think it was the 70s that Congress passed legislation to try to make it easier for, let's say, the scientist at a laboratory who has the genius and the inspiration to recognize, oh, this would have an application that's practical in the outside world to try to do that text transfer and get, get it um, in the mainstream of the economy. Yeah, I think, you know, things, th that discussion around tech transfer came about because people could look back and sort of see, oh, wait a minute, there's been these profound economic and technological consequences of government investment in research. So by the 70s, you had the examples of computers, which were now becoming more broadly used in, in business. They weren't just the domain of military and, and, and government. Um, you had satellites that were coming into being. Uh, and and um, so people said, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe we should see if we can make this a little bit easier. <laughs> and, and that led to things like the Bayh-Dole Act, as it's called. And then there was a follow-on to that called uh, Stevenson uh, Wilder that was extended by Dole actually to the, to the national labs. Because originally by Dole had been primarily focused on federally funded research performed at universities and Stevenson Wadler, et cetera. So, so that was really in the 80s that that kind of took hold and uh, created a framework where the uh, technologies that were developed as a result of federal investments in R&D uh, could be protected through patents and then licensed to industry uh, for their use. And, um, you know, this had happened before. There had been spin-offs. So, you know, one example in Oak Ridge was uh, a company called Ortec that was created in the 60s uh, because Oak Ridge was building detectors for nuclear physics experiments and they came up with some really good detectors. Every other research lab in the world wanted detectors from Oak Ridge and, you know, they just had a small machine shop. They weren't equipped or it wasn't really appropriate for them to start making detectors for all these labs that were sending in requests. And uh, there was another company called Tenelec, actually, that was, work that was doing detector electronics at the same time. And, and so the um, laboratory staff who were working on that said, well, maybe we should just start a company and then that way the company can sell the detectors and we won't have to bother with it. It won't be a distraction to the lab. And so um, they, they asked the lab director at the time was Alvin Weinberg, sent him a letter and said, we'd like to start this company to sell these detectors because it's, you know, it's the machine shop is busy and, and, and we don't want the distraction, but they're great detectors and, you know, <laughs> maybe it'll actually work. And it turned out Alvin was traveling in Europe at the time. He was away for two weeks, and um, the deputy director approved it. Said, that's fine, you know, just don't do it on your own time, evenings and weekends. Obviously, you can't use any laboratory resources. I mean, there was no formal policy, no framework for conflict of interest, but they kind of recognized this would be an outside the lab activity. Alvin later said that if, if he'd been there, he would have denied it because he, he didn't want people distracted from but he was away, the deputy approved it. So they, they, they actually raised money. They just went around to a bunch of their friends and collected, I think it was $500 each, which was a lot of money in 62 or 63, whenever it was, and um, started 
making detectors and selling them. And it was a success. And in fact, I think by about 1970, that company, Ortec, was bought by, uh, by, uh, by another company. And in fact, many of the people who started it liked that entrepreneurial activity so much that they went off and started another company that pioneered um, PET CT scans, so uh, imaging using nuclear medicine to do things like heart stress tests and so forth. And uh, so they started a company um, that was uh, successful, grew to control about a third of the market and was bought uh, by Siemens for about $900 million. Uh, so, you know, that was a, you know, example. In that case, that was people who'd been associated with a spin-out from the lab. It actually wasn't laboratory technology that, that created CTI, it was called, but it was, it was sort of the, the ecosystem of people and technology around the lab in Knoxville that created this company that, that uh, as I said, was purchased by Siemens. And, and uh, it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a nice example of, of how, um, you know, the, the ecosystem that can exist around a big research institution can support, you know, diversification and growth in the economy, even well beyond just the straight tech transfer that's enabled by the things like the Baidol. It's, it's not, so the licensing of the technology is important and useful because you need that legal framework in order for people to make investments, but at least as important is the knowledge that's in people's heads and the skills they develop and the colleagues that they meet that allow them to kind of come together to create these um, entrepreneurial activities. Having talked to many Manhattan Project um, veterans who, you know, one came up with nuclear detection machines at Chicago and then created a company called Nuclonics because uh, nucleonics, because the um, was such a demand for radiation detection after the war, and so that was sort of a spin-off. And he and some of his former colleagues and others started. But it is the connections, it's the ideas, yeah. it's. And you see the same thing today. If you look at, at you know the, you get this effect of clustering in in economic development, where, where you know Silicon Valley, of course, is famous for IT. Um, and if you, if you pull the thread on, on where did that come from, it turns out a lot of it came from defense-related government investments that were going into the area. Um, you know, it's Stanford University, the um, engineering, dean of engineering, Terman, uh, you know, recognized that a lot of the work that they were doing to support um, the, you know, the Cold War effort needed to have companies to turn it into real products and, you know, sort of allowed the faculty, I mean, this was heresy at the time, faculty were not to dirty their hands with starting companies and so forth, but said, you know, go start companies because there's nowhere, there's, there's no way to get this stuff manufactured that's critical to our national defense. And, uh, you know, that was, that was some of the technologies that were behind things like radar and so forth. And, that kind of bootstrapped along into information technology and you know so you can look at Silicon Valley and say well that's a great example of private sector innovation and risk taking and it is but if you actually pull the thread on what are the roots of it it's actually federally funded research that was taking places taking place in places like Berkeley Lab and University of California Berkeley and Stanford uh, finding its way you know, to the market, and then broadening off in different directions. So I'm assuming you've spent some time before Congress defending budgets for, you know, the laboratory and, and these um, scientific enterprises. Are these the kinds of s stories you tell congressmen to try to get them to invest in basic science research, or what kind of receptivity do you have? Well, for, you know, generally speaking, the, the support and interest for, for fundamental research is pretty apolitical. It's not a partisan issue particularly. I mean, there are different views in terms of, you know, how much should the government spend in general, but in terms of is it appropriate for the federal government to invest in fundamental research, that's got pretty good bipartisan support. Um, so it's, it's more a question of 
okay, it's appropriate for the government to do this, how much? Um, you know, and that's a, that's a tough question to answer because uh, there are all sorts of things that are demands on the public purse um, and, and, you know, ranging from health care, social benefits, defense, you know, all these different things are important. And, um, uh, you know, so it becomes a prioritization question and that's trickier because there's no magic formula that says, well, if we spend, you know, this percentage of our gross domestic product on research, we will have the economy we want. You know, we know there's a correlation between investments in R&D and economic growth um, and uh, that's why there's that broad bipartisan support, but it's not like a precise mathematical formula that just pops out the answer and says, okay, the amount of money that we should put in the energy and water bill for uh, FY19 for the Department of Energy's Office of Science is, you know, six billion dollars. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. And, and so, you know, in talking with people who have to make those decisions, it is important to connect the results of those investments to things that matter to their constituents. Why should I advocate for this federal investment over another? And, and um, the tricky thing with science, uh, you know, more fundamental science is, you know, the, the, the connections are a little further downstream. It's a longer term proposition. It might be 20 years or 30 years before it comes to pass. Uh, and that can seem kind of a long way off when you're on a two or six year election cycle. Uh, and the other thing is that the, the connections are not kind of straightforward, linear, do this, do this, do this, and a widget pops out the end. There's a lot of serendipity. Things happen by accident. People discover things they weren't expecting. That's hard to plan around. And it's also hard to explain. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is you know, the, the uh, science that we do uh, in universities and, and national labs is kind of creating a fertile ground. You know, in the end, it will be businesses, private investment that will turn that into some product. But you've got to have that fertile ground to begin with, that fertile ground of ideas that will lead to the innovations that turn into products. And, and that's a, you know, that's a more complicated thing to explain. So one last question here. Um, I wanted to, I was curious to see that, um, that Oak Ridge has a lead on, on uh, looking at the Large Hadron Collider's capability in the area of, of exploring the physics of the early universe. That you have a ALICE project at acronym um, and, and are, you know, interested in this uh, what we can learn about that. Can, can you talk about that a little bit and why, why that matters? Why well, should well um, as I said earlier, part of it is this, the, the um, you know, just the interest in understanding the physics of the universe, uh, which is interesting and beautiful in its own right. Um, and, and um, you know, CERN is a uniquely powerful machine for doing that. There are these massive collaborations that form around the detectors at CERN, which Oak Ridge is part of, and Brookhaven is part of, and Berkeley Lab, and so forth, and Fermi Lab. Um, hundreds of people coming together to try and make use of, of that accelerator to, you know, pull apart the fundamental constituents of matter and, and understand, you know, what holds the universe together. Um, the other aspect, though, is the value that comes, as I mentioned before, from tackling really difficult problems. And um, so in terms of, you know, the ultimate economic benefit, there probably, it's unlikely that there will be a direct economic benefit from the underlying science that's being done at CERN in terms of our understanding of, you know, whether it's the Higgs boson or, or quark gluon plasmas, you know, there's, there's not a product line that flows from that. But on the other hand, by tackling those really difficult problems and finding ways to solve them, I have a high confidence that there's going to be really useful things that will come out as byproducts of that effort. I mean, the best example is a CERN example, which is the World Wide Web. 
Well, the, the World Wide Web and the hypertext mar markup language, HTML, came about because the particle physics community was trying to solve a really tough problem about how to collaborate internationally and share all this data that we're generating. They had to have some way to, to do that, to, to work together across continents and have the data available so that people could work analyzing it wherever they were in whatever time zone in whatever part of the world. So in solving that difficult problem, the solution they came up with became the World Wide Web. Now, in that case, um, that's, that's an open platform. It was just shared. So, you know, CERN probably somewhat to their regret is not getting any licensing revenue from the World Wide Web. You know, Amazon's not sending them a nickel every time someone uh, buys a CD. Um, but uh, it's had a huge economic impact. And, and I think you could easily argue that the economic value to society of the World Wide Web compared to the cost of CERN, I mean, it's... It's inconsequential, the investment in CERN, in terms of the economic value that has been obtained for society as a whole. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, you're doing the science because you have this problem that you want to solve and this understanding that you will gain from that. And that is both useful and interesting in its own right. But um, part of the value is going to be that in solving that problem, you will find things that um, shine light in areas that are really unanticipated. I guess one, one thing we haven't touched on, just, I said that was my last question, but I just noticed, I uh, forgot about global security, because I know this has been also, this is, is a contribution. These are things that are going on at the, the laboratories. Yeah. Well, um, in fact, it was Weinberg liked to talk about the Faustian bargain of uh, nuclear power. Uh, and and one aspect of that is the fact that, you know, that same technology platform that we use for generating 20% of our electricity in the U.S. and growing fraction around the world, and we do it without CO2 emissions, and that's all good, um, is, can be repurposed for nuclear weapons in a way that could be destabilizing. And so part of what the lab does, Oak Ridge, but not just Oak Ridge, other DOE labs, uh, Pacific Northwest and Los Alamos and Livermore and so forth, is try and um, uh, develop technologies that can help prevent the spread of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, limit nuclear proliferation, uh, and that can be technologies for detection. So you can figure out, you know, are people doing what they're saying they're doing? Uh, are they doing things that we're not being told about? Um, also, uh, just monitoring the flow of material and making sure that it's all winding up where you thought it was going to go and it's not being diverted for nefarious purposes. Um, and, and so that nuclear nonproliferation mission is an important mission for the Department of Energy. Uh, and the labs support it through the, uh, the tools that they develop and also through the expertise, the people and their knowledge. And, you know, training IAEA inspectors, for example, is something that's done at, at many of the labs so that, that uh, as they go in to try and understand, you know, are people in compliance with their treaty obligations under the Nonproliferation Treaty, you know, they've got the technical basis for, for doing that, that analysis. And, um, of course, there was a, a big effort after the collapse of the Soviet Union just to secure a lot of the material that was at risk at a time when things were pretty chaotic. Uh, and so there was a great concern that there'd be diversion of material, which was sort of a shortcut to, potentially a shortcut to a nuclear weapon. Because it turns out the, the really tough part about nuclear weapons is actually getting the material. Um, the, the design of, of at least a sort of unsophisticated nuclear weapon, like Fat Man or Little Boy, is not that hard. Uh, the thing that's hard is getting the enriched uranium or, or the separated plutonium. That requires, you know, more nation-state scale activities that you can kind of detect at some level. It's hard to hide them and, um, and, and also pretty big investment and degree of te technical sophistication. So if you could get access to that enriched uranium or that separated plutonium without having to go through all that rigmarole of building up 
you know, capabilities for enriching uranium or, or reprocessing spent fuel uh, and hiding it, then you've got a shortcut to a nuclear weapon. So there was, a, there was a lot of concern after the collapse of the Soviet Union that there would be material that might be, uh, you know, at risk of being diverted because there was economic chaos and, you know, people were hungry and uh, the, the previous economy that had sort of supported the system was gone. So there was a big effort to secure that material and many of the labs participated in that. Now those programs have kind of come to an end. Um, actually largely because they were successful and the material was properly protected uh, and more recently because we're not getting along with the Russians so well so we're no longer so welcome there but there are problems in other parts of the world that have taken their place and that continues to be an important activity for many of the labs. And Oak Ridge had, had a very specific role I think they they call it Project Sapphire. Yeah yeah that so that was highly enriched uranium in Kazakhstan uh, in the 90s. So it was in this era after the collapse of the Soviet Union and of course once the Soviet Union was gone, Kazakhstan as a separate country, you know, separate from Russia became a nuclear weapon state effectively. And um, so uh, there was an effort to uh, secure that material to make sure, you know, to make sure, I mean Kazakhstan agreed actually that they really didn't want to be a nuclear weapons state <laughs> and, uh, and there was a concern that the material was at risk and so there was a team from Oak Ridge involved not just the lab but also the Y-12 facility so there's expertise at both um, that's, that's relevant to this to go and package that material up and get it out of the country to a safe place and, and there's been you know missions since then there was one uh, shortly after I became director at Oak Ridge in Iraq uh, at Tuatha which was had been Saddam Hussein's nuclear site back at the time of the uh, first Gulf War and uh, there was material there that after the invasion of Iraq people were concerned because there was a you know particularly at the time which was you know in 2007 it was a pretty chaotic time and so there was a concern that that material uranium oxide and so forth was uh, at risk of being coming uh, let loose in a very dangerous environment with you know extremists and so forth so a team was put together of people from Oak Ridge National Lab and Y-12 to go in and, and uh, package that material up the Iraqis actually sold it it was sold to a uh, Canadian uranium mining company so that it could then uh, you know, kind of go into peaceful uses. And that's another, you know, kind of like Sapphire, another example of securing that material to make sure that it doesn't wind up in the wrong hands. A lot of people are interested in advanced manufacturing. And I understand you have a lot of things going down in Oak Ridge. Well, in, in, in Oak Ridge, sort of the, the connection to manufacturing comes through materials. So it's understanding materials and um, you know, there's this really interesting kind of technological convergence that's happening now as you have new materials being developed that have improved properties. You have modeling and simulation that allows you to uh, design components that incorporate the performance of those materials in very sophisticated ways. And then the third component is there's these new manufacturing technologies like additive manufacturing or 3D printing which comes in various different forms that allows you to actually realize those designs that have you know improved performance with new materials validated in computer models realized in designs that you simply could not manufacture in the old school way where you took a you know a lump of metal and you machined away all the bits you didn't want and so uh, the lab has been involved in you know working with the companies that are developing new materials the companies that are developing the um, different forms of, of uh, advanced manufacturing uh, and applying some of the tools like high performance computing to you know develop the rule book for how you manufacture things in a way where you don't have the historical constraints uh, of what's called subtractive manufacturing and you know all the things that we're training people in engineering school about are kind of out the window in terms of what's really viable you can do things that would simply be impossible otherwise because you have those materials and you have the uh, manufacturing technology so the interesting thing about that is that it's um, 
not only enables kind of better performing products that presumably are going to be more competitive in the marketplace, it, it also changes um, where manufacturing can happen. Because if you look at the trend, you know, over actually many decades in manufacturing had been that uh, you, were, you always move towards manufacturing at very large scale the simplest possible things and then people assembling them. And that drove manufacturing offshore from the US. It went to low wage countries where you could have people assembling simple widgets into more complicated things and then selling them back to us. Well, with some of the new technologies, you don't have to manufacture millions and millions of you know, very simple things that you assemble into complicated things. You can directly, uh, you know, manufacture complex things that can be customized, changed from unit to unit, you know, just by changing the design parameters in silicon, you know, in the, in the, uh, the uh, numerical representation of the, of the CAD drawings that are in the computer. And now all of a sudden it's not all about low cost labor putting together simple widgets, it's about how rapidly can you innovate the design and how close are you to your markets. And so it has potential to kind of change the dynamics in terms of where manufacturing happens and actually the US is well positioned to take advantage of that because of course we have sophisticated design capabilities in, in industry uh, we have actually pretty cheap energy right now because of the shale gas revolution, which is another factor in where you're going to put your manufacturing. And you've got proximity to markets. So uh, in addition to being kind of really cool and interesting trying to solve these problems of, you know, how you're going to make these things in a way that you can be confident that you can fly them in an airplane or put them into a car and they'll perform the way you want them to and they'll be safe. That's a, a you know, science and technology problem. There's also this potential to, you know, maybe bring back some of the manufacturing that we lost between, you know, 1950 and 2005 in a way that brings it back, not as the low-wage, repetitive sort of jobs that we lost, but actually as higher-wage, more value-added jobs that support the sort of standard of living that uh, we want to enjoy in this country.